Let me just introduce myself, and I think we have a small enough crowd that we can spend a few minutes just going around the room and introducing each other, uh, introducing ourselves, uh, and then uh, who you are with if you work for anybody in particular. So my name is Ranjan Muthaya. I'm a senior professional engineer with the Stormwater Management Division uh, in the Transportation Public Works, and uh, you're going to hear from me uh, quite a bit. So uh, I'll just leave it at that. In case you're wondering where my accent is, Mr. Cubes wanted to know where I grew up. I grew up in Sri Lanka, and there's quite a bit, a bit of uh, mineralogy there. So good to catch up with some mineral stuff. <coughs> so let's start maybe over here, and then just go around the room. Uh, my name is Chris Johnson. I'm with the City of Fort Worth uh, School Water Management Division. I think the, that's a great uh, um, segue. Let me try to get this. Just a minute. Let's see. There we go. Uh, okay. So that's a great segue to uh, acknowledge the Water Development Board, uh, and thank you so much. Uh, this was uh, a uh, initiative, my understanding anyway, uh, through the governor's initiative of uh, dedicated grants uh, through a flood protection planning grant following uh, tragic events in the, uh, the central Texas from the 2015 floods that uh, uh, where people lost their lives. So appreciate uh, the Water Development Board grant. So first of all, thank you uh, for attending. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to go through uh, uh, some background information uh, <coughs> Kind of get up to uh, get get you all up to speed in terms of what's transpired in the uh, flood warning uh, part of uh, our stormwater management division. Uh, talk about what uh, we are currently doing, and then what we plan on doing with the grant. And the uh, the midpoint of this grant uh, presentation will kind of get you all uh, up to speed in terms of where we are in, in the progress. And in the final meeting, we'll we'll wrap it up in terms of what we have done and completed as part of this uh, grant. And so I'll uh, 
go through some of the uh, background. So uh, those residents that have been in Fort Worth are familiar with the history of the flooding uh, prior to the levees. Uh, there were floods in the 20s, uh, 1940s, and uh, I think that's a classical picture of the Montgomery Plaza building. Uh, and so that, that all led to the uh, creation of uh, the levy system uh, in the 50s. Uh, and then uh, subsequent to that, uh, lots of the flooding has been uh, kind of very localized, uh, urban creek level flooding. Uh, and then uh, the uh, city uh, created the stormwater utility uh, in 2006. Uh, following some, uh, some events that took place uh, in 2004. Uh, and you've got a picture here from Berry Street, where Mr. Cube's area. <laughs> uh, I think that person's like wondering, can water do that? Uh, levitate uh, vehicles like that? Indeed, they can. Uh, here's uh, some more recent events. Uh, I think uh, some of these events actually uh, caused much severe flooding in the uh, central, south central Texas area, San Antonio, that area. Uh, and this is some pictures uh, in, in 2015. So, uh, you know, the, the, the point here being that uh, Fort Worth is not uh, a stranger to flooding. Uh, we've uh, had fatalities in Fort Worth as well. Uh, and some of these uh, fatalities are related to uh, vehicular traffic uh, primarily, and you see all the kinds of different things that have led to some of these uh, fatalities. You, you can see the, the, all the driver, driver, driver uh, kind of uh, thing. So I guess the, the, you know, one of the take-home messages from, from this workshop would be that people get into their vehicles and lots of the fatalities uh, take place while uh, people are in their vehicles. I want to kind of just uh, go through, and this is a busy slide, I apologize. Uh, but uh, just kind of give you an idea of uh, what uh, the the city, uh, primarily the stormwater division people, do prior to some of these severe events. So here's like a rough timeline, seven days prior to a severe event, and I've drawn the uh, severe event as that box, uh, and then following the, the severe event. Uh, you don't have to read through the slides, but, uh, you know, we do get in information uh, from our uh, Office of Emergency Management um, folk, and they get fed information from the National Weather Service, Corps of Engineers, the Water District, and Bob Carl's here. Appreciate you being here, Bob. So, you know, we get information fed in uh, that kind of gives us a forewarning of some of the severity of these events. Uh, the uh, flood uh, maintenance crews uh, run routes, they uh, clean uh, storm drains. Uh, in, in some of the areas that are likely to experience flooding. And then you can see uh, a couple of days, like a day before, the kind of the, the intensity of the response intensifies for a severe flood. Uh, barricades are pre-placed, uh, you know, additional personnel uh, are called in. Uh, people go into a 24-hour operational mode. Uh, and get ready for the event. And then following the event also, uh, there is quite a bit of uh, <clears throat> activity in terms of follow-up. Uh, you know, our, our stormwater uh, crews remove the barricades that they have pre-placed at some of these low water crossings. Uh, we, uh, on the planning side, you know, evaluate how some of our storm drains uh, infrastructure performed. Uh, and, you know, depending on the severity, uh, you know, there may have been additional folk uh, involved uh, outside the city. Uh, and then if there is uh, something like a presidential declaration uh, declared for the, the event uh, as took place, I believe in the Thanksgiving flood, uh, you know, we uh, try to uh, recuperate some of the, the city's cost uh, for, for, for the, for the, for the uh, response. So here's an example of uh, uh, maintenance crews responding uh, to a flood event with barricades. Um, I'll point with the, uh, mo uh, the mouse over here so you can see the flash system that uh, we have at these low water crossings. And uh, 
So the, the, the barricades are placed to prevent people from entering the, the, uh, the, uh, these low water crossing sites. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on these uh, low water crossing sites because that's kind of our starting point for the, the, the flood warning system that we have and that we plan on expanding into. So uh, one of the uh, ways uh, that even you know, the TFMA uh, has uh, promoted uh, the T Texas Floodplain Management Association promoted is to create more flood uh, awareness through uh, to turn around, uh, don't drown kind of uh, educational signage. However, that doesn't work all the time, and this is actually uh, uh, one of uh, my colleague's presentation where he talks about the 13 luckiest people in Fort Worth, and here's an example of people driving through uh, kind of the low water crossings. Uh, in this case, it wasn't barricaded. But uh, one of the tendencies of people is to follow the vehicle in front, uh, and this is an example of that. Uh, another one is people just sometimes uh, don't even uh, follow, you know, observe the barricades. And so in this case, this was the fifth luckiest driver. There, we've got the first luckiest driver, too, that, uh, uh, that we've got. So uh, in, in terms of the... Uh, the analysis that was done on a citywide basis following um, some of these uh, major events, the historical events where people also tragically lost their lives, is that we evaluated these uh, low water crossings uh, based on the, these nine criteria that you see listed over here, ranging from you know, the depth of overflow, past incidences, whether there were fatalities, the number of uh, high water rescues, uh, all the way through to detour length. And uh, 285 of these uh, low water crossings were evaluated. And, uh, <clears throat> and as a result, uh, you know, the, these, uh, these low water crossings were prioritized. And, and I'm going to kind of go through a little bit of the, the history of those low water crossings. Uh, initially, uh, following uh, three fatalities, um, three test locations were identified for these low water crossings, uh, and then um, there was uh, additional 15 flashes from the 285 we prioritized, and then you know the, the top three got the high water uh, flashes uh, first, and then went down the list, and then in a 2004 bond, additional 15 flashes were placed. Uh, <clears throat> and then you can see immediately, you know, after we did that, uh, there were additional fatalities that uh, that drove uh, kind of the, the importance of this effort. Uh, and then uh, in 2010 through 2014, uh, we received uh, funding from the uh, Texas Department of Transportation through what's called the La Parfa uh, program to install. Uh, 38 additional um, uh, these uh, low water flashes. So um, we have currently uh, 52. Uh, some, sometimes one or two just kind of get up, get out of operation and have to be repaired. So 52 of these low water crossings uh, across the city. And you see the kind of the distribution of those low water crossings uh, in this map. Uh, roughly broken out by timeline uh, in terms of the, the distribution of these, uh, this, this flashing network. Now, uh, <clears throat> let me just back up just a little bit. These flashes uh, also have uh, rain gauges on them. And this, this one uh, doesn't show that, uh, but uh, these uh, the 52 uh, crossings have 39 of those. Uh, Low water crossings also have rain gauges uh, associated with them. And those, uh, the, the rainfall from those rain gauges are broadcast um, almost uh, live through what's called the alert system to a base station on atop uh, Bernard Plaza. And so we, we get uh, live uh, rainfall feeds. That's what you see on the left side over here is the uh, rainfall uh, distribution of the, the gauging sites. Uh, and uh, in terms of a regional picture, you can see uh, what 
the rain gauge distribution looks like. Uh, that's kind of what uh, Bob Carl at the National Weather Service sees in terms of the regional picture of uh, uh, what they uh, get in terms of uh, rain gauge uh, measurements. Now, why are these rain gauge measurements important? Uh, the Weather Service, for example, uses it for the river forecasting for the large river basins like Mary's Creek, uh, Trinity River Basin, uh, things like that. Uh, again, the National Weather Service uses these rain gauges to calibrate the radar measurements to get predictions on how much rainfall is going to fall. Uh, and then uh, the CASA team that's uh, also represented here uses it uh, to provide uh, more fine resolution uh, rain, rainfall uh, estimates and uh, rainfall uh, radar signatures. So, uh, this rainfall network is very important uh, for, for kind of the, the, the flood warning system that we are going to uh, build off of the existing network. And I'll talk about what we plan on doing and a little bit of the technical details uh, of what, what we plan on doing with this uh, rain gauge network based off of the flash system that uh, was in, initially installed from the, the 2000 uh, actually from the uh, mid-1990s period. So what does the, uh, this high water warning system look like uh, where we have rain gauges? Uh, and hopefully you can see that. Can you all see that slide or should I turn the light or, uh, lights off a little bit more? Maybe just a little bit more, okay. So maybe on this side. Yeah, there you go. All right, so, um, <clears throat> uh, so these high water system uh, uh, locations consist of a uh, pressure transducer, the current one consists of a pressure transducer that measures the water levels. Uh, either uh, roadside, we have a very few of them that are actually measuring the water level within the street right of way. And then we also have the majority of our uh, uh, water level sensors that measure the water level at, these, uh, at the creek that you know, have the low water street uh, crossings. And these uh, pressure transducers uh, trigger the, uh, the flashes when the water rises above street level, typically about half foot or if the rate of rise of the water, you know, it measures how quickly the water is rising to kind of say, hey, the water is rising rapidly enough that it's going to flood, might as well turn the flashes off. So you use this both. And the system um, that, uh, that communicates all that information is called alert. Uh, even though I don't mention it here, let me mention it now. Uh, the alerts, the, 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 the high water warning system also has rain gauges. You see one of the rain gauges sitting above uh, that master control station right there. Um, and the, uh, the water level uh, information is uh, broadcast to our first responders. So they know when these triggers are being uh, triggered. Okay, here's kind of a schematic of that uh, system again. So we talked about the pressure transducers. Uh, we saw a picture of this master controller over here, which has uh, an antenna uh, that communicates the information received from the pressure transducers as well as the rain gauge. So there you see a picture of, the, of a typical rain gauge. Uh, it's, it's a tipping bu bucket system that goes back and forth every uh, f four hundredth of an inch. And every time that trigger, uh, uh, the, the tipping bucket tips, it sends off uh, the information uh, <clears throat> that's received ultimately at the, the base station. Uh, so all of this data that's collected locally over here is uh, collected by the uh, master controller and then this master controller uses uh, radio frequencies and that's what this alert system is. Uh, if you have a radio, actually, you can tune to it, and all you'll hear is just chirp. chirp, 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 chirp. Not interesting stuff. Uh, that just transmits those tipping bucket and all the and the pressure transducer trigger, triggers 
uh, to a uh, receiving station. So there's an antenna atop Bernard Plaza that receives that radio frequency, just like a regular, you know, uh, radio that you listen on your radio. Uh, and then there is equipment inside Bernard Plaza that downlinks the radio frequency, and that's what you see, this complicated equipment over here, that takes that radio frequency, cleans it up with what's called the cavity filters, so that takes that noisy frequency, cleans it up. So your radio stations have the same thing. Uh, you know, they have these cavity filters, uh, that well, the ones that uh, receive information anyway. Uh, and then all that information then is uh, electronically processed into zeros and ones, and then transmitted via a your you know your internet cable, it's Ethernet cable, but uh, your internet cable to a server which has software operating in it that understands that alert communication. So that's pretty much the communication system we have uh, right now. And here's an example of the pressure transducer that uh, sits uh, at, at a culvert uh, wing wall and just measures the water level. So that's what measures the water level. There's a uh, sensor here that translates the, wa the water level to, a, uh, to electronic <coughs> or the pressure of due to water into an electronic signal. Is there any questions on this? So you're, you know, if, you, if there's any specific questions, just stop me. I'm hoping that we'll have uh, about 15, 20 minutes just to have an open discussion on where you all see, whether, you know, get feedback uh, on, your, on your thoughts on, on where, you know, where we're going to go. So the uh, software we cut, yes? So how do you determine locations where your food is alerted? Pardon? So how do you determine Oh, okay, yeah. So those uh, locations were based on the 285, uh, you know, low water crossings across the city that were inventoried based on a uh, ranking system. And we uh, prioritized that. And what we, what we have right now are 52 of those locations have these, uh, these sensors on them. Okay, so the software that we currently use is called DataWise, uh, and um, you see version 7.5 on your, on your left, and the more recent, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, more kind of web-enabled interface uh, on the right. And this is stuff that we see internally. Uh, the software, one of the limitations of the software is that it'll have a difficult time kind of converting that information that you see over there and then kind of putting it out into the, for the public to see. Uh, I have a question about this software right here. Yeah. So when the rain gauge collects, uh, rain gauge collects rainfall data, right, it's not always at the regular time interval, right? If you want to do something using this data, putting your hydro hydro hydrological modeling, it's better just have a regular time interval. Does that software do that data processing for you, or just the basically their, their post-processing needs to be done after you collect data from data-wise software? Right. So let me just go through what you just mentioned. Yeah. So uh, the, the alert system we currently have, and this is a very important point, uh, the alert system that we currently have, it's what's called an ALOHA system. Whenever those triggers take place, that information gets broadcast. So if the antenna at Bernard Plaza is uh, busy receiving information from another site, let's say there are 52 other sites, right? So site 30, for example, is broadcasting that information, and it's busy trying to get the information from site 50. It's not going to listen to site 30 because it's busy with site 50. It just drops that. And it'll go back, and it'll pull back uh, to that site, like site 30, and then whenever it's ready to receive site 30, it'll pick up the cumulative signature. So whatever the history of the, you know, whatever was collected up to the five minutes, it'll pick it up then. So the time interval is pretty regular? I would say you have a polling, you have a polling time that, you know, there's a polling time, uh, and I think that's five minutes. It'll poll around and get okay. that information. Bob, did you want to add anything? Well, yeah, I was just going to say it's only regular when it's raining. 
if when it's not raining, a true alert system, when it's not <coughs> raining, unless you've got other equipment, like out of Texas Motor Speedway, yeah. where they have one of their weather stations, that broadcasts all the time, because it's got temperature, wind, all that, so we're getting data every 15 minutes. A true alert system will not, if it's just like a rain gauge or something like the, the transducer, will maybe send a message twice a day saying, hey, I'm still out here working and that's it. It will not start sending regular messages until it starts raining and the bucket or tipping on the water starts going up, you know, to the pressure transfer. But other than that, you're only going to get a couple messages a day from the, from the equipment out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah one thing too, and that's, that's important, you know, when it rains, uh, you got to understand that the system is very busy. You know, there's all these stations just sending all the information. If, if the current system that we have is that if, if, if the base station over there at Burner Plaza can't listen to that particular broadcast from a particular site, it'll just wait for it to, you know, pick it up later when it goes and listens to it. So there's quite a bit of data collision problems that it has to deal with. With this alert system, okay? And we'll talk about how we're going to take care of that problem. Excuse me, one second. Yes. But as far as the information on the flash, I would think that's the most immediate need, obviously, is to warn the people that are actually driving yes. up on us. Yeah. That goes off immediately. Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's that that doesn't have any, you know, issues with the communication. It goes off immediately. Now, you know, the, the those those flashes also need to be diagnosed, tested in the field, and so on. So there's, there's actually a two-way communication from, you can, so you can tell this controller to communicate to the flasher, and the flasher can also communicate back to this controller. You see this little antenna? So there's com communication back, back and forth between the flasher and the controller. But good question. Hey, Rajan, uh, the current system has measures both depth using the pressure transducers at the crossings and also has the rain gauges at the same location. Correct. Yeah, not, not exactly the same, like, exact physical GPS location, maybe within 30, 40 feet, you know, of, of the, oh, the, okay. the, yeah. So it's, but, but it would be on the master point. controller. See, you see it? It would be typically on the master controller. Right, right on top. Right. And this master controller you want to protect because you don't want it to flood then just wash downstream. So you want to keep this at a secure location. But, but I guess my question is going back to, uh, I guess, the gentleman here that asks about how you decide to, to locate the, the, get the rain gauges. Because obviously it, it makes sense to have the pressure to measure the depth so right. the flashers can go off mm -hmm. in the low water crossing. But should the rain gauges necessarily have to be located at the same location as opposed to measuring rainfall somewhere else. Yeah, let me go to uh, the... to, to sound, the, you know, to... Right. It's two different things. Yeah. yeah, and that is the convenience of having the communication equipment already by the low water crossing. We do have very few purely dedicated rain stations by themselves. Uh, there are five or, five or six of those just purely dedicated weather stations. The, 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 the convenience factor here is that we already installed the communication equipment associated with the low water crossing, so we measure rain gauge and rain data at those okay. footprints. So it was a convenience? Uh, primary, a yes, convenience yes, yeah. That those were yeah I, would, I, would, I would characterize it as such. Yeah, I mean, it's very convenient if we can maintain at one location for both devices Right. As well, and I think that also explains what was the rationale actually for the city actually install all the gauges right now. If you see it on the map, what yeah. it was, I think convenience was the main, main yeah. reason. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, and that's one of the the limitations we you know you 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 have with you know locate co-locating like this, uh, and uh, you and you. You guys are already solving my problem, by the way, because <laughs> the, the plan is to expand our rain gauges and determine those rain gauges based on the rain needs yeah. than, you know, the convenience factor. Yes. Early on when the system was being planned, when Fort Worth was first putting this in, they came out, we met with those guys, and what we wanted to do was show them where there are other real-time rain gauges around the city, so if they were going to put in just a rain gauge, it wasn't going to be 
200 feet from another one that might already be there. So it was hopefully going to spread the wealth out and try to get more spacing or better spacing for the rain gauge network. So yeah. that was taken into account in the initial run of the system back in the mid-2000s. Yeah, okay. so, so he, he, and, and it's, it's, it's good, good that we're spending some time, so I might skip through some of the, uh, this, so this is not waste of time discussing this. So if you look at the regional level, obviously storms don't like start in the boundary of Fort Worth and then they, you know, just leave the boundary of Fort Worth. They have a regional perspective. So you can see some of the, kind of the, the holes in our rain gauging network out south, southwest, uh, quite a bit west. Guess where all the storms come from? right, from this side. In fact, the storm that's brewing is out west and it's coming this way, right? Uh, we got quite a bit of coverage out east because we have a good network with the neighboring cities, uh, maybe some more, uh, you know, uh, holes to fill up in the, in the north and the northwest. I have a couple questions about the stages, uh, the ring gauges. Uh, so first of all, I, I mean, I think a lot of the lower or across the east coast, for example, underneath the bridge. Uh, so under the type of structure, probably have trouble capturing rainfall accurately. Uh, so I just wonder, I mean, do you actually have a consideration for ensuring that these gauges are functioning correctly? Because the primary problem with the US is that their gauges are not well maintained. So there are a lot of uh, information coming from gauges just not very useful. Right. The second question I have is that <coughs> do you have any plan to hook up these gauges on the TCP network so that we transmit it to our crucials to a better service to be able to capture these gauges? Yeah, and, and that's the plan. A any data we collect will be uh, may, you know, made available in real time. Uh, right now, we, we make, make it available uh, to uh, Bob Carl's shop, uh, and he what's, the chef encodes it, right, and sends it to his folk. Uh, but the plans are to make all the data av available in real time. I see. So what is the latency of the network itself? So say I hook up with so yeah. how much time it takes before the gauge data can get there? Yeah, I would say five to ten minutes. Five to ten minutes. Yeah. I, I don't know the, I think it's five minutes. I could be wrong, but not more than ten minutes. So does it actually have dependence on the gauge locations? Yeah, you know, those, the, the alert system itself pulls around and gets its stuff within five minutes. So if it drops the station, it will go back and pick it up within five minutes. Oh, yeah, your previous question, right? In terms of the, let, let's look at that picture. You know, it's not the most ideal locations in some cases because, you know, the, uh, you want to have a 45 degree cone clearance around your, your gauge. Uh, and, you know, the, my understanding is that the new requirements for the weather service is to have 30 foot, you know, height at which you measure the uh, rainfall. And some of these sites, I wouldn't say all of them, some of these sites don't meet the criteria. Okay, so I think we've uh, uh, covered <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, so I think you all are getting a picture of what we have, and so this kind of back and forth question is, is awesome because we can kind of resolve a lot of, uh, you know, what the, the issues that we have had to deal with. Uh, I think the point that I was trying to make here is that these uh, flashes that you see not only have to, uh, you know, come on in terms of uh, being triggered properly, but also have to be placed properly so that the approaching traffic uh, doesn't get stuck, you know, uh, you know, after they drive in. So some of these, in this particular case, you can see the, the street has got two uh, flashes, but we also have cases where there are multiple flashes spread around dealing with the approach into those low water sites. Um, <clears throat> and let me add this too, is that in places where uh, we think these low water crossings uh, are pretty well positioned in terms of capturing rainfall, our plans are to add uh, additional rain gauges uh, at, at, at these sites, so we have uh, two gauges that are ca capturing rainfall. Uh, at intense storms, uh, you know, I don't know whether you all have gone out there when it rains a lot, it doesn't rain straight down. You, you, <laughs> you know, it's got a vector component to it, it takes a direction. Uh, and then if you measure, you know, two, put two buckets next to each other, you might not get the same rain. So that's the idea here, is to kind of have some uh, 
redundancy to be able to check it. Okay, so I went through the uh, alert uh, protocol, and uh, let me also mention since CEDA is here that, uh, you know, uh, and, and kind of it leads to this, uh, this, uh, this second uh, phase of, I think, this, this uh, our flood warning system, is that, uh, you know, people do observe barricading. Uh, they are, uh, studies on of, of all, all the limited uh, of, of you know observing uh, drivers is that most of the time when they see these flashes uh, you know they tend to drive through them anyway you know they don't turn around and don't drive they, you know uh, so the, you know the effectiveness uh, is uh, to be fully proven yet even though that in, you know that when you drive you see it uh, and here are all the kind of the reasons why that they found these uh, drivers uh, <clears throat> going through these uh, flasher sites. Uh, don't tell me if you have, if you are, if you if you are, if you have thought of one of those. Talk to me after. So I guess the the kind of the the, the prelude to the flood warning system is that let's make the information available to our drivers and our homeowners and you know, our, our residents uh, so that they may, can make informed decisions before they get into the car and, and get into trouble. So that kind of uh, leads to this flood warning uh, system. A flood warning system <coughs> would have all these components that we talked about, you know, the high water warning system, but it's also going to have a kind of an informational component whereby um, we'd make the information available, not only the, the high water crossings, but also the rainfall, <coughs> rainfall intensities, the radar signatures, uh, and make it available so that uh, the residents can make an informed decision. We're not going to tell them what to do, but we'll make that information available. And uh, that's the overall thrust of this grant. And the grant uh, will run through December of 2017. So what's the overall purpose? Uh, so we're going to develop a flood warning system uh, and we're going to uh, make sure that our measurements uh, that we're actually measuring in the field are reliable, that the, the fall signatures are minimized as much as possible, uh, and then we're going to disseminate the data. So we have uh, a total grant of 630 plus thousand. The city is cost sharing 60% of that. Uh, and the Water Development Board is uh, through the, the, the flood protection uh, grant money is uh, going to match it at 250,000, roughly, rough orders of magnitude. And uh, we have selected a consulting uh, company to help us along with this. Uh, and <clears throat> Some of them are here. Uh, the folks from Distinct uh, Designs are the experts in the uh, communication uh, systems. Uh, they have experience in, in emergency management. And uh, Telos is, is part, of the, part of that expertise. And then Atkins, uh, which involves Ramesh and Frank, are here. Uh, will. Uh, provide support uh, not only in terms of the communication, placement of gauges and things like that, but also provide uh, leadership uh, on the flood response uh, planning side of the, this grant. So I'll just kind of uh, briefly uh, outline what, what the components are. So we have seen uh, elements of this. So we will capture the rainfall. Um, you know, make sure that our uh, water level sensors are working when they're supposed to be working, check the accuracy of that. We will improve the telemetry. We are using alert right now that we talked about. We're going to move to something called alert two. That's a lot more cleaner in terms of the way things communicate. Uh, we are going to uh, keep uh, inventory of our data, make the data more available to the public. Uh, make more data 
and uh, more intelligent data available to our emergency managers, and we'll also uh, broadcast that information to our partner agencies like the Weather Service. So here's all the different folks over here. Uh, let me also actually, since Derek is here, <laughs> and the county emergency guys, I'm going to pick on you guys. Uh, just acknowledge their participation in this effort too. Uh, so in terms of the grant dollars, uh, we think, uh, you know, we have, we have to finalize that the consultants uh, came on board <clears throat> relatively recently uh, because of the approval process. But we think we can, with our budget, uh, install up to 20 new rain gauges. Uh, at the existing sites, we will look at uh, uh, installing up to two, 10 additional uh, <clears throat> uh, water level sensors to check for the, the pressure transducer system. Uh, we think we can install up to 20 new uh, rain gauge sites. Uh, we will keep the existing alert system operational. That's kind of a, it's very tricky to just tr turn off the switch into a new communication. So we'll keep our existing system working on alert. The new system will move it to a more uh, better uh, alert to communication system. And then when things have been sorted out, we'll switch, switch on to full-time alert too. Uh, we'll upgrade our flood warning system, uh, flood warning software, and then we'll also develop a flood response plan. So let me go through alert two. Uh, essentially, uh, there's lots of technical <coughs> stuff in here, but <clears throat> the overall benefit of this alert two is that it uses GPS clocks to timestamp the signatures. The alert signature does not have any timestamp. So because you have a GPS clock telling the uh, base station when you know, it collected the data, it can hold on to the data longer and actually get more accurate information. OK, so here we talked about the rain gauges. So uh, we'll be you know, looking at uh, <clears throat> getting uh, good coverage, particularly in areas where we have like those missing um, holes in our uh, rain gauge uh, network. And uh, we have I preliminary identified this from a previous consultant, but the new consultant will uh, reevaluate this. So these uh, triangular sites uh, were identified uh, as areas uh, <clears throat> we have we could install new rain gauges, uh, but uh, certainly this will be re-examined by a new consulting uh, team in light of use of the Alert 2 network. Okay, and then um, we'll also be looking at, uh, uh, instead of just relying on one type of uh, water level sensor, we'll also be looking at a different type of uh, uh, sensor to measure the water level. This is what's called a bubbler system, and uh, it has uh, a, uh, this is actually a CO2 cylinder, so it uses uh, the pressure experienced by a, uh, a CO2 bubble pushed through a tube to measure the, the water level. Okay, so this is kind of the, the, the box where the, uh, the equipment is, but the equipment measures stuff sent down from a tube, you know, that could be 30, 40 feet away. So you don't want this located next to places where, flood, where floods take place. It's just a different way of measuring the water level. And that kind of will provide validity against something uh, a lot, uh, you know, a lot less complicated and maybe even less accurate than the, uh, this bubble system. But it doesn't mean that we are abandoning the, the, the pressure transfer. It's just a way of checking uh, how our water level measurements are working. So the flood warning software itself, uh, we're going to replace our data wise system. <clears throat> We've uh, issued uh, a, uh, a bid for that already. Uh, we've received three bids, and those are being evaluated right now. 
and the software will be uh, evaluated uh, to ensure that it works with not only alert, but also the alert to the, the system that timestamps the signatures collected in the field. And we'll uh, make that, we want to make sure that it's got a strong public facing component uh, that, that uh, could be delivered through that software. The flood response plan, obviously all these are detailed and we'll, at our mid uh, point of meeting, we'll provide more information, but there are the, the flood response plan will have three main components. It's gonna have a planning phase. You know, what is, it, what is your, your inventory, uh, you know, of how you respond to uh, flood emergencies? What do you do during floods? Kind of that seven day timeline that I showed you. Uh, it'll document and identify missing gaps in terms of how the city responds to these flood emergencies uh, and identify best practices. And then we'll also have a post-flood uh, eval uh, post component to this uh, flood response plan. Here's the project uh, timeline. Uh, it's, it's pretty tight, uh, but we think we can get it done. Um, so we've already secured the uh, software uh, and we're going through bid. From starting around May, June period, we think we can uh, get the software implemented through December. Uh, the equipment installation, uh, we are getting started on it, and uh, that will run through uh, December. And then the flood response plan, uh, which Frank and Ramesh uh, will be leading, uh, we'll uh, get started once they have all the information in hand and met with staff and so on, uh, <clears throat> starting around May. And I've just marked out where we think we can uh, have our public meetings. We don't want to just come out here and have nothing to report. So we want to have something to report and we, somewhere around June, July, perhaps into July, we'd have our uh, second public meeting. All of you all will be here then, right? Yep. Okay, thanks. Wait a minute, let's, let's have spend more time on this then. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's kind of uh, the, the project. I, I want to kind of move on to how the flood warning system fits within everything else we are doing. And some of our folk here from the stakeholder group meeting would kind of be able to relate to this. But uh, ongoing with with all the other activities that we do is there's this long-term strategic planning that uh, the uh, stormwater division is undertaking, looking at a 10-year horizon uh, and uh, evaluating you know, how best to position ourselves and certainly the flood warning world is an integral part to that. And if you want uh, information on that, uh, <clears throat> that's uh, available at this website. And uh, the timeline for that uh, is uh, through January 2018. And if you'd like to participate in that, there is a uh, public meeting uh, scheduled uh, May 16th, 6 to 8 p.m. And I assume that will be here, right, at Hazel Harvey. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, kind of uh, related to this flood warning, uh, not funded through this grant, but I wanted to talk about this anyway because this is an ongoing activity that kind of connects up with the flood warning. Uh, we are working with the CASA team to evaluate a uh, handheld for cell phone application for eventual distribution to the residents uh, <clears throat> so that you know, you can not only get the more refined CASA radar, so this is not your next rad radar. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a network of uh, very localized uh, radar footprints. Some of the UTA folks are here too. Uh, they are working on this. There's a, a CASA radar located on top of the UTA library. But uh, you can see that's kind of this, those black circles there that, that measure all the radar within that small footprint. And they all network together through the uh, internet. Uh, and they kind of, two or three radars can track a storm through the, the neighborhood, you know. It gives you very localized information. And so you can see all that information uh, on a cell phone app 
and you can specify where you are and it will give you a warning of, hey, a tornado is expected your way, you know, it's three miles away, or take cover, or it's three minutes away, so you can either specify time or distance. And our field uh, crews will be evaluating this, our police and fire will be using this uh, and evaluating it, testing it out, uh, and helping the CASA people before they can before they release it to the public. And the other thing is, uh, the uh, CASA team is also looking for uh, um, voluntary participants that want to participate in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the, the flood response. Uh, and you know, if you would like to participate, uh, please talk to uh, Cedar or spread the word out. Uh, essentially, this uh, kind of uh, asks the people that went through the <laughs> flood water and ask them, hey, why did you cross the water? That kind of thing. Okay, so uh, I was going to spend a few minutes going through, you know, what a potential publicly facing uh, website could look like, and if, if I, my clicks work properly. I can show you what some of the other neighboring cities, uh, not neighbor, uh, some of the other cities in Texas have done, Harris uh, and uh, the flood control district in Harris County has done. And then uh, the Water Development Board also has plans, if I understand it right, uh, Josh and uh, Ivan, to collect all the data that's collected across the state and kind of create a statewide uh, flood uh, awareness website. So let's see whether this thing works. Yeah, so that, that works. So here's what uh, they have developed in uh, Harris County. And this is, you, you can see it's not raining there, so everything's zero. Uh, but they make all that rainfall data that's collected in real time available to the public. Uh, and you can, uh, you know, query uh, individual gauges. Uh, let's see, let me like click on one of those for more information. <clears throat> Uh, that's nothing to report, but <laughs> you can see it gives you a timestamp, uh, and they have actually moved to the Alert 2 net, uh, net system, and uh, they, they have only, you know, signature drops out of one every 10,000. So out of 10,000 signatures that get through from all these sites, they drop maybe one, maybe one. So that's how much of an improvement they've had with the Alert 2 system. <coughs> And also, Harris County is a flood warning system here. The data actually can be exported. I mean, it's, and it, if that's the system from the cores, the data actually also can be exported, downloaded for public use or research purposes as well? Right, yeah. We, we uh, do have that now in kind of, but not, not in a, you know, not in a easily accessible form. So part of the mandate here is to make all the data available for, for folks like you to download yeah. in real time. Yeah and run your model and do all your fancy stuff. <laughs> so uh, let me go through the next one. And this is the uh, uh, city of Austin and neighboring cities. Um, so that's what they have. And they actually cover a significant area, not just uh, <clears throat> Harris County, you know, which is this county. City of Austin takes care of the neighboring uh, cities. And you can see it's essentially maps on the dot, you know. Uh, green, good, you know, not, no, no major problems. Red, you might want to think about going around there, or you might want to click on it, you know, and find out what's going on. It's closed. Uh, I don't know whether it's flood-related right now, but anyway, it, it makes, makes you aware of what's going on. Uh, and somewhere along the way, you can actually right-click and say, hey, I want to just subscribe myself through texting to only you know, some fixed number of web uh, sites. And then whenever those get triggered, either rainfall or low water crossing, you get a text. <clears throat> and then uh, let me, oh, let me also go. Okay, I, I messed that up. So let me go to the uh, Board Development Board website. It's texasfloods.org. So you can kind of see what the Water Development Board itself uh, sponsor is uh, working on. 
Did I get that right? It's without the S. Texas Flood. Oh, okay. Flood. You got two down below that. Yeah, Maybe you had it yeah. yeah, TexasFlood.net. Oh, no, I'm sorry. TexasFlood.org. <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect segue. We do like to reference that it is the Steve Ray Bonnet. Yeah, I know. Okay, so let's see the Texas flood viewer. There we go. They actually have a you know a network of. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I let's see if I can move that out of the way. They can click on the bottom right there. I have red the blue bar. The blue yeah, bar. Click on the blue bar. Where do you see the? Okay, I'm sorry. All right, there we go. So you know we we can right now. I would say the. The uh, most of the data, correct me if I'm wrong, comes from like the, the main main stems of rivers and things like that, right? So all our data essentially would go in here too. All right, so I think I have done all the talking that I wanted to. Now I want you all to do the talking, to kind of uh, either you know we have provided you all forms. Uh, We provided you forms to to answer if you don't want to speak up, which is fine. Uh, and just kind of uh, let's discuss these things. Uh, and uh, the first question is, uh, what do you commonly use uh, to receive severe storm and flooding information? And I kind of put out there in kind of brackets what, what how we plan on using this data. Where do you get, you know, your information from uh, severe flood? Maybe I should speak up. <laughs> I, I, uh, honestly, for me, uh, I use uh, Weatherbug. How many of you use Weatherbug? There you go. We've got some Weatherbugs out there. Uh, so it's a cell phone app, you know. I don't tip, I, I mean, although I have a, a NOAA radio at home, I don't rely on that, honestly. A TV, uh, when severe storm hits, I actually watch TV and I'm on my computer looking at the CASA radar <laughs> same time. If you don't want to speak up, that's okay. Just if you if you write and provide comments, we'd certainly be interested. Uh, you know, I, I think the, the the purpose here is to kind of uh, make sure that when we make our data available that we reach out to the, the right people. You know, I, I know that uh, some of the social media companies like Twitter, I know, is very uh, involved. Uh, I'm talking about the CEO of the company going to these flood warning meetings. The Twitter guy, the CEO, going to flood warnings. Like, what? But they are involved in this stuff. <clears throat> Okay, I'll just keep through, going through, and then maybe you know some of these questions will come up. Uh, so, which cell phone app? And we talked about Weatherbug. Uh, or website do you use to receive? Uh, this is a little bit more kind of internet centric. Uh, website do you use to receive weather information? Weather.com. Weather.com. <laughs> All right. Radar scope is a good raw radar app because you're looking at the data, the raw data straight from the radar. One you got to pay for, but it's like three ninety nine. That's the only app I have ever paid for, and uh, it saved. Well, it didn't save bacon, but it was pretty close to it when we were going back to Michigan at Christmas because I saw the tornado warning and we pulled over and let the storm cross the road about five miles ahead of us. But I was wow. using that app and. You could see the hook and everything in it. So, wow, yeah. that's awesome. So, yeah. But it does, the nice thing about radar scope is you can look at the, the storm total priest, you can look at the one hour estimates. So, that data from the dual pole radar network is on, is available there too. Let's go to number three. Uh, what uh, do you first? 
you you t pay attention to the like the the National Weather Service storm warnings watches, uh, and then if you do or don't, either way, what specific actions do you take? <coughs> Avoid driving. That's a good one. Yeah. How many of you, uh, okay, and let me go to question number four. Uh, what city resources, uh, city of Fort Worth resources, do you use to get and or prepare uh, either storm and output storms to, to, to prepare and cope with uh, severe storms or flooding? How many of you are signed up to Nixo? Nixo? Just, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, let me put that as a public, <laughs> broadcast it out as a public announcement. Uh, just go to Nixo and you will get uh, the uh, emergency, our Office of Emergency Management broadcasts, uh, warnings, alerts, things like that, related to severe storms and flooding. You want to spell that for us? Yeah, N-I-X-L-E, it's just a cell phone, cell phone app. So our city forces already have, but it's not, you know, very, like, in, in one case, actually, I was sleeping. I got it at 2 in the morning. I, I was not on that street, but they actually named the street in which there was severe storm. It's like, get out of your bed and get, you know, get to your class <laughs> at, at 2 in the morning. Luckily, it was, like, in Chris's area, so I said, I hope Chris is safe. I noticed on the number four, you leave off the storm warning, so you just, you're making it just flooding. But, uh, yeah, I wanted to just expand that anyway in terms of storm. I mean, the Nixel will give you all storm, you know, and flooding and yeah. things like that. Um, yes. I, believe it or not, I count on my wife and my daughter. <laughs> they, they're hypersensitive about that stuff, so I usually hear about it from them. And we turn on the TV. Now, the problem we're, that we've realized is during all, with a lot of these dish TVs and all, that during the storm, that's out your TV. So I really think having a cell phone or app and all that, uh, you know, so that you can take into the, during a storm especially, take into the uh, you know, place for refuge. Um, but I kind of, to be honest with you, I just sort of count on my wife. She just loves it. You know, I think women are much more into the feminine trend. Who is it, Delcus? Yeah, Pete. Oh, he loves the yeah. weather. <laughs> yeah. And so, I do think it's good to stay in nature, like you were saying, especially if you're traveling, you know, to have, uh, have yeah. access to storm information. So something that I think the public does need to know more about. Right. The EAS over your phones did work in that storm that I was in in Missouri, the Boone Hill. The phone went off, both of our phones went off, even though I was not here, we were, you know, 700 miles away. And uh, when they, when the Paducah office put the warning out, the phone, my phone went off, so it worked as it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. It does seem like we, I get cell phone notices, you know. So yeah. Yeah. It takes more attention to that now. So let me kind of go back just a little bit to, would, would an app like this, do you think, be useful for you all? You think that <coughs> it would kind of give you a, you know, heads up in terms of, uh, you know, not only showing you where the intensity of rainfall is, admittedly, it's not nationwide, it's just around the metroplex. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you're out in the baseball field, I know that when my kids were playing baseball, you know, I thought the, the umpire was kind of letting the game go on, even though they was like, hey, wait a minute, we're going to get drenched in five minutes. Yeah. But he kept the game going on. But, you know, something like this where you can put a, you know, a circle around where you are and say, hey, you know, the storm's going to be there in five minutes. You know, or there's a tornado headed your way. Or, uh, let's see, some of the wind, even the wind, right? Some of the intense wind events. It measures wind too, the, the, the car radar. Say, Roger, just a question. Now, CASA system is a completely different system, isn't it? From, then the, from what the city is now trying to implement. Yeah, this would be a part of their effort, but you know, we would. You know, feed our information okay. 
through our grant. And that's where I'm showing. Yeah. yeah, so that's where the connection is. Okay. You know, uh, actually, right now, Eric, uh, who's the software guy, uh, he, he's working on subsuming the rainfall uh, and also uh, working on, you know, highlighting the, 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 the catchments, the watersheds across the city and saying, hey, it's raining real intense in this watershed, and just kind of highlighting those watershed areas. So there'd be a mutual exchange of information between what CASA's doing and... Yeah, and it, we have continued, we have, you know, we've had collaboration with them okay. and we'll continue on. But, you know, the, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see, and what I'm saying is that, you know, the, the, the software side of it is mainly to make sure that we, we collect the information, good information, you know, have some system, it could be dots on the map, to get that information out to the public. Uh, and then, the, you know, we would try to leverage ongoing activities like this to kind of get the information out through apps like this. Now, I guess another related question to that is, you know, for the, for the, for the lay person, there, there's, there's costs and then there's the stuff that the city's doing. And, you know, for the lay person, you know, there's like five different apps. It's, it's like going to the supermarket. It's like, you know, which, what, which one do I yeah. pick? What's, what's right for right. me? Yeah. And how, that's... how are we going to help people make that decision? Yeah. It's going to be very important. Yeah, Chris, go ahead. Let me try to sort of fill in a couple of gaps here. Um, Ron John's point uh, and, and Ramesh's points are, are very good. We've got source data from the agency. We've got source data from X-Ran and the Weather Service. We've got source data from the CASA radar, which is a separate source data. Okay, so what we're trying to do at the city is we want to be part of the information data collection team and we want to be able to make that information available to anybody who can use it as best we can. And then one of the reasons why Ron John's asking these questions is because we want to get an idea of what resonates with people. When we start putting information out, where should we be talking about putting it? What do people want to use? Do you want to use a cell phone? Do you want to look at your TV? want to go to the weather service, do you want to go somewhere else to a, a weather bug app, you know, what what has what what are you really going to use? And so that's really kind of where some, some of these questions are going. So it's we're, we've got a multiple sources of information. We want to get it to people and part of what we need to understand as part of our grant process and our flood warning process overall is well, how would you like to see it? Would you like to see it on a web? Like to see it on a phone, both. You know, that's kind of what we're wanting to have a little dialogue about for a few minutes. Yeah. yeah, I think most people will probably be able to see it on the, on the phone nowadays. Yeah. yeah they're gonna, I mean, having plenty of phones is going to be the first cut. Mm -hmm. but, but if you make the data available, wouldn't the free market package it up and supply it however suits their needs in terms of yeah. like a weather bug app? I think is that. Wait, is that a TV channel app that they put it out in order to... The, yeah, WeatherBug is a de dedicated you know, app, and, cell phone app, yeah. There's, you know, it seems like the dissemination would be, you know, held by, you know. And, and we want to do some of the pushing of it out on our end, but we also know people are going to reach down and grab it. Mm -hmm. You're exactly right. Yeah. Why you're wanting to be a data collection Why? source and well, we, our number one goal is to be able to, for, we've got a, a stormwater management division, and part of what we do is we try to make uh, flooding damages for people and property be reduced over time. And we can do that a number of ways. We can regulate. We can go out and do flood control projects to reduce the amount of flooding in a certain location. That's really expensive. Or we can basically tell people where the floods are and when so they can avoid being there. So we try to do all of those things. So the, the warning part is what we're here to talk about tonight. So part of the reason why we want to collect the data and make it available is the warning component as opposed to 
making the flood go away or breaking rain. Right. But I'm, I'm just thinking someone else has already, when you're talking about just a warning the general population out there, someone else is already collecting that data and warning the population. Yeah, and, and we won't be the mouthpiece. Yeah. Right. That's why we're kind of saying, where, where do you want to get your information? Because if that's your mouthpiece, that's who we want to collaborate with. Right. But you're talking about collecting that data and then supplying that. Yes. But someone else is already collecting that data and supplying it. But we're, having, we're adding to that, that data collection network. We're going to have new gauges in places where there are not gauges so that the people like Bob can have better information to do his forecasting better because he'll have additional information to work with. Yeah, yeah, maybe this might clarify things. Lots of the, and Bob, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the, lots of the information that the National Weather Service gets is, is, is city sources. So Grand Prairie has its own network. Fort Worth has its own network. Dallas has its own, this, you know, operated and managed by these cities. And then Weather Service has its very limited dedicated weather stations. USGS has its dedicated, limited weather stations. The Terran Regional Water District has a you know, limited set. So they collect all of the data and make it available to their forecasters and you know, their folk that look at radar signatures and things like that. But they rely on the city supplying them good data. If we didn't exist, they'll see a big black hole in the city in terms of rainfall. How good does the data have to be, and how precise does the data have to be just to send out a warning? Uh, pretty accurate, you know. Uh, if, if uh, you know, some of those intense storms take place within 15 minutes. Uh, we got very flashy watersheds. If you miss the stuff within 15 minutes, you're already <coughs> flooded. Uh, we have, you know, like uh, some of the folks can relate to the Central Arlington Heights. People go to work in the morning, come back in the evening, there was a huge flood in there, they didn't even know about it, because it's gone in 15 minutes. But all the damage is done in 15 minutes. So if you don't catch those intense storms in 15 minutes, and that's why it's important to get all that communication proper. Because if, you, you know, if you're going around polling every five minutes, the, the old system, the alert system, you know, you'll miss some of those intense events. The, the flash flood operations in our office, we, we have, we have a, a program that surprisingly, I, it was really buried when we first got in the software, and I don't know why they did that, but we we pulled it out and the forecasters use it, but it's a, it's it looks at all the real-time rainfall data coming in, so when we get Fort Worth, when we get Dallas, and we get Grand Prairie, and all that data comes into the system and is ingested in the database, the, the screen will update for the forecasters so they can go and look to say, okay, um, the Grand Prairie alert gauge at this location had three inches of rain in 45 minutes. You know, we know, so we have an idea what's going on for the warning. So we can make this, the, the flash flood warnings maybe a bit more specific. Like, you know, instead of saying, you know, there's, we're, we're, there's somewhere between, you know, two and five inches of rainfall, we know we had measured three inches of rainfall here, which goes back to the accuracy of the data. And, you know, then we can say that if we're expecting another one to two based on what the storm trends are doing with, with the, the radar estimates uh, as it's falling now. So the data is invaluable, especially in real time flash flood operations for us. And, and frankly, that's where our struggle is in the office is to try to keep the real time data coming in and flowing as it should. And from my standpoint, it's turned into a nightmare. And, um, but I'm hoping we can fix it. So it's, 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 it's kind of a fractured system, and, and that's one of the things that, that I, I'm hoping we can rectify. Before I <laughs> another, another quick example is, as you saw, we have rain gauges on the flasher locations. If we did have a rain gauge somewhere else up in the watershed, and we have an, uh, it measures an intense rainfall, then we could actually have people heading out there with barricades before the high water warning flashers go off. We could actually get there first and give people a better level of protection. Yes, Jesse. Um, I was, was going to ask, um, if the city is going to use um, a 
like the social media apps and stuff like Facebook and Twitter? Are y'all going to like utilize those to um, get information out there? Like just like uh, I don't know how it would like, to, like happen, but like alerts like through to yeah, I, I, you know, I know that we, and hey, Linda, we might have to tap into your expertise on this. I know that the city has Facebook and the city communications office post stuff on there. The question is whether they post any, any of the kind of the emergency information on there, let's say rain, flood, tornado, that kind of stuff. They do if, like, operations. Emergency operation department okay. asks them to. Um, if it's something that's, you know, within hours and it's on a weekend, unfortunately not um, when it's needed. If it's something that is a big, you know, build up to and that you have enough low lead time, then they're going to be posted about that. Um, so that's why the Nixle is important because that's where our. Office of Emergency Management uses Nixle to get out yeah. information. Okay. Yeah. Um, very oh. short t time frame. Uh, yeah, because a lot of people, they don't necessarily have an app, and they're more likely to be on, on Facebook or Twitter mm -hmm. or something. And yeah, good point. A lot, of people, uh, a lot of people use Twitter for news, so I would figure like a lot of people would, would use Twitter for like weather news. Yeah, I feel like that could be, I mean, it'd probably be a lot of work, like, you know, yeah. like to like, have an additional person to be tweeting out and, you know, posting updates about every, like, thing like that, but that's exactly what we want to hear. If that's, if that's where you get your news, then we need to be aware of that. Well, I think like, one of the successes of that ATX floods is that the city is a clearing citizens warning other citizens. So they're just forwarding on the warning yes. from other citizens. They're not generating it themselves. Sure. You know, and, and that helps in real time yeah. be able to kind of get the message out and people help each other. Yeah, it's a good that's, that's been a very helpful access that, you know, aspect of their system. I mean, I mean, social media data right behind it is big data. So this, this age is people is doing a lot of harnessing big data. I mean, so for example, when Ebola was kind of on the break out at that time, so Google they did some analysis, they find that people searching for the Ebola keyword in there. They literally they can just kind of identify where the people in the panic and also search in correlation and find out. And, and that's something very interesting. But related to floods, I mean, that is another thing. Obviously, people say, hey, I, I, I see floods somewhere. That's a factory information. And also, that thing can be passed on to the next one to see the tweeters or maybe on the Facebook, and they can really see something happening. And then you pack the georeference data to that information, you literally know what's mm -hmm. going on, and match with that information. That's a very reliable source. Yeah, I've been doing that for a while, crowdsourcing. Yeah, they're all crowdsourcing. Yes. And they have, they have a program running just to collect the data. Yeah. Um, but there will be a lot of problems, so if you have something, you know, the creator, I mean, the creator is coming, you can take it, can have a two threads communicating in the same location, you have to make sure you differentiate these. So, I mean, I mean you know, it's useful, but it's not like, I mean, a panacea and everything. So, you know, I think that uh, I, I would take that too seriously. I just have a last quick question right here on this. So, this is a system to me is uh, instead of called flood warning system, it's more like a flood monitoring system because you collect data and there. And in my mind, flood warning has a warning feature. Basically, is hey, the system making decision for you. So where is the information you need to be kind of be alert? So typically, the way people do it is put a hydrologic simulation, and you have a now casting feature in right there. Yeah. And take the high, rainfall data and put in hydrologic model, right. like RFC. Bob, they do there. They take that rainfall data, running their hydrologic model, and output what is the hydrograph gonna look like, and so give people more lead time. And so is, is that the step the city eventually going to go towards, or just this is the flood warning system you're going to build on at this moment? That's a, 
that is the, the final uh, terminal point. We have no <laughs> firm plans to get into the forecasting business. Okay. We might. We will evaluate that. Right now, the objective is <coughs> to collect and share information. Um, it, which includes, uh, just if I might add, Chris, which includes warnings that the weather service releases, that our Office of Emergency Management releases. That kind of, the, the warning aspect of it, the, the, the kind of the central authority for the city is the Office of Emergency Management. So all of that will get fed into the public facing component of our communication tool. But we ourselves in Stormwater are not going to be in the business of issuing, mm -hmm. at least for the foreseeable future, issuing the actual warnings to collect that information and just make it available. Oh. Sorry, Chris. Nope, that's, that's basically it. But we're, we, we won't likely get into the forecasting business anytime soon. No firm plans, no funding for that. Um, we're going to do the best job we can to monitor, yeah. share the information, let others do the warning, make sure it goes to the right places, um, work with people uh, like Bob to basically, when we give information, and, and, and with Cedar as well, and basically say, here's the neighborhood names that fall within this watershed that's associated with this gauge. We've got that information, we can share it, and then other people that are in the warning business that really are good at that, they can do that job. Yeah, well, one of the things, um, you know, is that we can, like of the, of the docks on the map, you know, our system will kind of highlight, hey, the sensor is saying that the, the water levels exceeded the, you know, the crest of the road. Boom, it'll highlight in red. You know, as to how you use that information and you know, tell people, hey, you know, uh, avoid this, that's not going to be explicitly like, you know, it should be pretty obvious you know, to the, the residents seeing that information that hey, this, is, this is an area that you want to avoid. Uh, but that information will be made available you know, in a you know, pictorial form. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question about the uh, sensors. <coughs> have you guys thought about using traffic cameras to capture street flooding and feeding that information to you know, stakeholders? Yeah, we've kind of uh, had some discussions on that. Uh, How much interest in that would there be? I, I think it's very interesting because I personally developed a flood warning system for the Texas Magic Center, and just being kind of that was the first device to actually we want to put in because really avoiding people, I mean, going there to see how high the water is in the bayou, we yeah. can see from remotely, right? That's one. And also, we are building another flood warning system for the city, Grand Prairie, and we had a couple of first responder meeting, and a lot of response said, hey, why can't we just have an infrared camera? And these days, a lot cheaper than. And the text dot has a lot of uh, traffic cameras I mean, installed on highways. Yeah. And I don't think that's a, only one I know in Houston looking down at a 288 highway, the Grace by watershed. I mean, that's the one that I know. So a lot of resource can be I mean, it's, uh, re I mean, reduced. I mean, it's, uh, you don't have to install a new one. Just turn the angle towards the low cost. Mm -hmm. cool. well, yep. I mean, there's maintenance. But part of the reason that we wanted to talk to the public is to say, you know, if we got 90% of the people said, man, the ideal thing for me would be to log on to a website, be able to click on a dot, see the camera, know what that low water crossing looks like, so I can make a decision. If, if that's where everybody is, we need to know that. But you're exactly right. All the infrastructure multiplies the maintenance. So exactly right. And also the the bandwidth. Yeah, the other 
Yeah. Think about one picture frame, how much of information is communicated. Uh, it'll overwhelm the you know the real feed, real time feed. So that's the other big consideration. Really, what these forms sent back to? Oh. Pardon? Oh, you can you can leave it uh, there on the on the table, or if you want to uh, take it home, take it home uh, you can you can uh, send it to uh, one of us, including Linda. We'll give you the address. That'll be all, that'll be great. I assume you want to talk to your wife and daughter, right? <laughs> Use of the phones, you got yeah. different ages. So I think it really is going to be the combination of all things. Yeah. I yeah. don't think you can, I mean, in a perfect world, yeah, an app, if everybody knew how to use an app. Right. But there's so many apps. Yes. And, I mean, I'm always being told, you know, on, on Google, you know, different types of maps to use, different type of, you know, to show the road construction going on. Also, it gets so confusing, especially if you're older people. Right. Say, they stick with one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, TV sometimes if you're at home that's a great use, yeah. but then again sometimes you can't get it. Cell phones are good. Uh, you know, I think you just have to be open to all of them. So I wouldn't think we'd want to have one one thing to go to. Yeah. You'd have to have at least three, I think. Yeah, and, yeah, and that's you know the, by making uh, and you know part of the objective here is you know uh, to kind of uh, to. to to tell you all that you know we are making this information available to the, the, the public, and you know whoever wants to access the TV, cell phone app, developers can access it and come up with their own thing, you know. And so yeah, I think we will hopefully reach reach out those folks, uh, you know, and, and you know they'll use this information, you know, in, in terms of how their specific applications. Yeah, Chris, like for instance, when you ask the feedback question, we have such a small sample. meetings that we've had. So it seems like you're just going to have to look at it as like, okay, lowest common denominator. What are the different things people use? Just go at it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess, I mean, we started off talking about the dangers that drivers have coming up to a low water crossing. Hopefully they're not using an app while they're driving because that's a, that's a whole different kind of thing. Um, but, but, I mean, so there's a limited amount of information that, yeah. Yeah. you know, State yeah. On yeah, I think I think part of the uh, uh, CASA team there, I think, trying to make it voice uh, activated, so it'll give you a kind of a verbal. Let me ask you a funny question. What color is the warning light? Flashlights. It's uh, yellow. Okay. Now, there's something about that I've never thought about before because I don't really come up to too many yeah. warning lights, to be honest with you. But yellow imparts. Caution. Yes. Okay. If you want to stop people, you, you should be having a red. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. By the way, these conversations have a long history too. <laughs> it's like if it's you come up, if you yeah. up to a railroad right. crossing and it's yellow, I yeah. guarantee you, you'd have a lot more. Yeah, fatal. Yeah, that is true. Uh, and I think, Chris, you have been involved in these discussions with our legal team in terms of red versus yellow flashing. Just think about it. But that's like a, with the yellow light, people yes. are accustomed to, I mean, yeah. I, I, yeah. I pass and, and I feel a little guilty getting halfway out right. when it's yellow. Change, and I'll have idiots that are two car lengths behind me coming behind me. Yeah. So it seems like... Uh, you really need to start looking at red if that's what you're trying to tell people. They're not going to pay attention to yellow. They're used to, they're trained to, to speed through yeah. yellow. Yes. Yeah, point well taken, and I'm trying to recall uh, the, the, the legal history behind that, but it's been uh, rehashed re and rehashed uh, through the legal department, and, uh, and that was my thinking too, it's like, why aren't these red? You know, stop the people and send them back. Uh, but it, it, it turns out that legally we can't use red. Red means stop, but you know, like a stop sign. Put that yeah, put that, put that on there, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, there you go. Another thing, another thing that, you know, to add to what Rick is mentioning, is on the, the warning system that whereby 
people should stop, but yet they go around it. Barricading, yes. Well, the barricading that you've shown in your illustrations are those that you bring in. Yes. So, my suggestion would somehow have something connected to the warning system that lowers a barrier where it's a tall, skinny tower that goes across, and when it gets to the red warning sign, it automatically lowers it and then automatically raises it when it's safe. And, and then maybe even have one of those, um, something like pulsating red uh, like laser, <laughs> laser thing. <clears throat> And, and it also makes a, a, a some, yeah, you know, some. it's kind of a racing, make it a racing laser thing that is emitted so you don't have something that's automated uh, to come down in case it, you know, in case this fails. You have a, a laser light coming across that and, you know, that will get people's attention. So, and it probably would be just a matter of ease for some of these radiacs who are in the years to, uh, could probably do that in less than an afternoon. Yeah, yes. Yeah. There are some cities that have this railroad crossing type gates, gates. come down with that. Um, I think they work to a point, but then they've been known to be driven through, too, because people just ignore them. Well, and at least it would it it, it's, uh, it's better than nothing. Some people go out, and there are some cities that will go out and close the gates. They have, like, metal gates. Mansfield does. And he knows when he sees certain stuff, he will, he's got metal gates that they will go out and shut the road with, because they know it's going to they know it's going to flood. But it's a manual process. It's not Well, you know, I was trying to get, gate. you know, assist with the manual, because okay. you have more than one area where there's warning signs, you need something rather than having to get people to be shuttled out there with and physically toting those warning sign barriers. Good input. I think there's also laws that allow a city to recover the cost of the rescue, the high water rescue. Could be enforced or could not be enforced. I mean, that also tends to make people think twice about, you know, if that's publicized. Well, now, just as an aside, I think uh, the efforts of this project might help the city with some CRS credit. Um. Good question. I think uh, it does have a component of a flood warning, yeah. I think CRS is like a comprehensive look at everything, and I think this is one of the components. I think Frank can verify that. Yeah, so uh, I think we are eight, CRS of eight, so this may, will help us kind of move a little bit higher up. And help to, to those that are not for, are not aware, the CRS kind of sets the national insurance uh, rates, uh, and having systems like this help get that number down a little bit, you know, uh, and then that'll help the insurance rates uh, that you know that our insurance payers pay. A good point. All right, uh, sorry, I think I went 40 minutes over, but I assume you all had a good time, that's why. <laughs> Thanks for attending. Watch for the mid, uh, the, the kind of a public meeting in September. We'll uh, get that out a little bit more aggressively with uh, inserts in the water bills. Thank you so much. <laughs>